Today, we're going to talk about the process, kind of like an overview of the process. We're going to talk about the USDA National Organic Program regulations, which is, of course is what you need to follow to become certified organic. We're gonna go over some common issues and concerns, record keeping, everyone's favorite, and Q&A session. So that's sort of the plan. Um, I'm probably gonna be moving pretty quickly through some of these slides because there's a lot to cover. Um, just so, you know, we'll just see how that goes, I guess. Um, first, NOFA New York. I think most of you here are probably familiar with the organization. Um, there are two branches. There's NOFA New York Inc., which is the parent company. Um, they're the ones who you're seeing here who've, who've created this awesome virtual format for the Winter Conference this year. Um, they do farmer, consumer, and education, advocacy. Um, they mind to do all the field days and workshops and have a technical assistance hotline. So they're very busy and do a lot. And then the other part is the certification office, the NOFA New York Certified Organic LLC. We're based out of Binghamton, New York, though we're all working remotely at this time, like most folks um, in today's world, it seems. Um, we are accredited by the USDA National Organic Program to offer organic certification services. Um, we verify compliance to those regulations and we help farmers and processors um, determine whether their organic system plans are compliant um, by looking at things such as approved um, prohibited materials and different types of farming methods. So that's just a really quick summary of NOFA in New York. Um, a little history and overview for the organic program. Um, the USDA National Organic Program, or the NOP, you might hear me say that throughout, um, that's the shorthand for the National Organic Program. Uh, the standards went into effect in 2002. Standards and regulations also are somewhat interchangeable when you hear that term used as well. Um, the NOP accredits independent agencies like NOFA New York to perform organic certification of farms and processors. The USDA, the National Organic Program, does not certify themselves. Some people get a little confused about this. They are not a certifier. They just oversee and offer that accreditation to other organizations who are the actual certifiers. The scopes of organic certification include crops, livestock, handling, which is another word for processing basically, or handling something after it's been harvested, post-harvest, and wild crops. So there's four scopes of organic certification. So this is like a fun little map we like to share. It is one year old, so keep that in mind. We actually did report slightly more um, in 2021. We, re we update in the Organic Integrity Database, which is online and really easy to find, and it includes all certified organic operations worldwide. So it's a really useful tool, but you know this is kind of giving you a snapshot of what we certify in New York State I don't know if it's easy to see or not, but you can kind of get an idea of regions and areas where we might see clusters and more or less. Um, yeah, so it's kind of cool to see. It says 1,051 current operations. We're at like 1,070 or something, I think now. We do certify primarily in New York State, but we go into some of the surrounding areas as well. New York State is the third largest in the United States for organic producers, so that's really exciting. And there's a lot of fertile ground for um, certification here. So yeah, um, you know, we're constantly trying to increase, you know, and, and get more and more folks to kind of get into that organic certification realm because we think it's important and good. Um, yeah, so that's that. Okay, so the process. You want to become certified organic. Um, this is sort of what you what the process looks like it is annual so you do this every year it gets simpler after you've done that first year because you've established your organic system plan um, and then you know it's it's a little you know it's not as complicated after that first year so the first step is really you submit your complete application and your certification fee payment um, the applications can be obtained on our website there's a link in the certification tab in the conference app so it takes you directly there or nofany.org you can also just request them from the office. We get the requests a lot. So you get your application, you're gonna fill it out and submit it. We're gonna do a review of that, make sure everything looks compliant to the regulations. Then we're gonna issue you a letter 
that letter we make seek to clarify um, certain items in your application and it's going to prepare you for some things to have ready for your on-site inspection. Well, on-site or virtual, but if you're a new applicant, you are getting at least some aspect of it verified on-site because that's a requirement of the regulations are doing virtual inspections now since COVID. Um, and so once you are certified organic, it's possible um, to, um, you know, that you might see a hybrid or a virtual inspection. So that's been kind of different and exciting in the last year or so. Anyways, um, so you're going to get your inspector assignment. The inspector is going to contact you um, to, to do the on-site inspection or the virtual inspection, depending on where you are in the process. Um, after that occurs, we're going to receive the report back in the office. We're going to do a review of that report along with all of the other documents in your file and make a certification decision. Um, and then you will receive that letter with the determination, letting you know if you're approved, pending, if there's additional items that might be needed. And at that time, we would issue your certificate if able. Um, if there's additional information needed, we would, would request that and then the certificate would be issued. So that whole process tends to take about three months. Um, so from a complete application through till the end for a first time applicant. Um, once you're in the process, you might get that inspection at any point in the growing season. So, you know, that process is not necessarily always to three months from start to finish. Once you're certified, um, you remain certified no matter when your inspection occurs. Um, a certification is valid until surrendered, suspended, or revoked. So, you know, there's some people like to think their certificate expires if it's over a year old. It does not. Um, it does not expire. So. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about the timeframes, um, just to kind of give you a sense for when you submit your application. We do encourage new applicants to get their, um, get their applications in as soon as possible. So we can kind of start that process when we're doing inspection assignments. And, you know, the inspectors do tend to think geographically when they're making their plans for the season. And so it's just really useful to kind of have that information earlier rather than later. So you can see it's about three months, depending on, on when you get when we get the application in for when you might expect completion. Keep in mind, any applications received after August 31st are not guaranteed completion. Um, and also keep in mind, if this is your first year, you're just becoming certified for the first time, some of those early crops, um, you might not get certified in time. It's usually pretty tricky with things like first cutting hay, some of those early spring greens, strawberries perhaps, I see asparagus there on the slide. So, you know, ideally our inspectors start going out, you know, depending on the spring, it could be late April, but usually May is the earliest we start doing growing season inspections. So to get that whole process completed in time to market those early crops can be tricky. If you have those and you're, you're looking for that and needing that, please do communicate that to the office and we'll do the best we can. You can also choose an expedited um, you know, option for an additional fee if it, depending on what your markets are like. So keep that in mind as well. And keep in mind that you cannot market or sell anything as organic until you've received your certificate. Um, sometimes people think after they've had their inspection that, and the inspector says, yeah, it looks good you know, looks good, um, that that means that it's okay to then sell their things as organic. That is not true. Do not do that. Um, you could get a notice of non-compliance, likely will. Um, so, you know, it is important to just keep that in mind. You're not certified until you actually have like that certificate, which would probably be a PDF attached to an email or a hard copy, depending on what your preference is. Keep that in mind. So cost share program, this is something we like to talk about. Um, it's a really great program. It really helps people overcome that initial cost of certification. Once you have gone through the process, completed the process, you've, you've become certified, you've paid all your fees, you're eligible. Um, you can receive 50% of that fee that you paid per scope back um, up to a maximum of $500 per year. So the, uh, any of the scopes you're, you're um, certifying, you can, you're eligible to get that 50% back. It, you can apply through New York State Department of Ag and Markets and through local FSA offices. They have the application. So it is separate from 
getting your organic certification with NOFA New York. Um, but we make it really easy. We do work closely with ag and markets and we, we might send the application to you to kind of facilitate that process. But yeah, once you're certified, please do take advantage of that program. It's really good. Um, just keep in mind, they have to be certified by August 30th to be eligible for, for the year. So yeah. So who can use the term organic? You have to be certified um, to use the term organic. If you want to say 100% organic, organic, made with organic, using organic practices, you know, pretty much any time you want to use that word organic, you have to be certified organic. There are some misconceptions out there about that. Um, it is a word in the dictionary that is true, but it's also a word that's more or less owned by the USDA. So it's not as simple as I'm going to throw this up on my market sign because the dictionary lists it. Um, yeah, so keep in mind, it is a highly, highly regulated um, we issue a lot of non-compliances every year for things like this, or we get complaints. Um, a lot of people at farmers markets in particular, it seems we hear a lot about that, that just kind of don't quite understand the way that that term can be used. The only um, exemptions or the only times you can use the word organic without being certified is if you make less than $5,000 gross organic sales annually. Um, there is an exemption for that. So if you're very, very small scale, you can say organic, can't say certified organic, and you have to be um, willing to be audited by the government if you're going to use the word. I've never heard of that happening, but it is in the regulations that if you're operating under the 5,000 exemption that you have to have your record keeping available. Um, you have to follow the standards as well, you know, so there's that. And the other thing we like to mention to people who are thinking about becoming certified organic for the first time, or maybe they've already, they, they've been certified, is this is a mandatory voluntary program. So, you know, you are choosing to become certified organic. And in that process, um, you know, you have to follow the regulations. So, you know, people might complain about some aspect of the regulations or say, it doesn't make any sense, or why do we do this, or, you know, this or that. And, you know, we 100% agree at times and can, can see when um, that could be the case. But we just remind you that, you know, you are choosing to become certified and we have no choice but to make sure you're in compliance with all of the regulations. Um, and so the same would sort of you know, go forward to you too. We get audited just as we audit you on, on the process and on the, uh, the requirements. There are penalties if for false representation, it is in the regulations. And we do know of um, instances where that's occurred. So yeah, keep that in mind. And if anyone's not sure where they fall on that, just yeah, happy to talk about it some more. So the first step really is establishing your organic system plan or your OSP. Um, this is the living document on how you manage your farm as certified organic. It's, you know, internally, we consider it the main piece of your application. It's basically a booklet with lots of questions on how you manage your operation, what your um, intention is and how you're gonna be following those regulations. So there's sections on you know soil fertility and nutrient management, pest control, storage, post-harvest handling, labeling and marketing. Um, there's split operation if you are doing conventional and organic, what measures are you taking for segregation, things like that. Um, there's also forms associated with that main piece of, of the application that you'll obtain, which would be your new field history and affirmation forms, um, equipment lists, maps, Inputs intended for use if you're doing livestock, there's livestock records as well, the animal list, different barnyard layouts, um, different records associated with that. And we're going to be talking about all of this stuff more as we go through. And then again, if you're doing on farm processing or value added, there's separate for that. So that whole, that kind of all of that together is what we think of as, as the organic system plan. It's kind of like how you're planning to meet those regulations and the forms you're using to do so. So basic land requirements. 
kind of the the baseline you're trying to decide do i get certified organic this year do i not can i even be certified organic um, really, the thing that you have to determine is, is your land eligible? That's really the thing that we can't work with you on. It either is eligible or it's not. Um, most of the other regulations, we will help you um, come into compliance, you know, a process of back and forth and, and getting you to there. But with land, um, there's really not much we can do. So that baseline is no prohibited substances for three years. So, you know, there is a land transition. If you have been farming conventionally using conventional um, fertilizers and pesticides, which are prohibited, you know, you would have to start that process. Um, so we do sometimes do land transition with folks. Um, most often we see people apply the year their land is eligible. So as far as what to be paying attention to when you're trying to figure out what's been applied to the soil, is it eligible or not? treated seed, um, prohibited pelleted seed, GMO seed. Those are all things that would be considered prohibited and you would have to wait the three years from the last time those were used. And then like I was saying, most of the synthetic um, conventional fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides and things like that would also be prohibited. So the other, in other situation we see pretty frequently is um, new, newly rented or purchased land where maybe you yourself haven't owned it for three years, so you're not entirely sure what's been applied to it. We have a form that's part of that new field um, documentation called the new field affirmation, and you would get the previous owner or manager to complete that, indicating what has been applied in the last three years, and then they would sign off on that. Um, and that is sort of how we verify the three-year history for newly acquired land. So those forms will automatically come with the packet, um, your application packet. So you'll have those and you fill out your new field histories with everything that's been done. Um, sometimes you're not really sure if it is or if it isn't. Call the office, email the office. Um, we'll check, you know, we'll look into what the materials were and letting you know if they are or not. Uh, we can understand you may not want to fill out the whole entire packet if it turns out there was a material that was applied that disqualifies your land. So keep that in mind. Um, other land requirements, crop rotation is a requirement. Um, if you're doing perennial, there's other things in lieu of crop rotation to be taken into consideration. Building soil structure, some keywords that you'll see in the regulations a lot is maintain or improve. So we're looking that you're maintaining or improving the quality of your soil, natural resources, um, some other elements as well. And Another thing we'd like to mention when we're talking about land is treated lumber. Um, this is pretty common, most farms using, especially livestock, of course, you know, you've got, you might have treated fence posts or other types of lumber. Um, more or less grandfathered in if there's no direct contact with, with, with crops. So if you have um, some treated installations, you know, that as a new applicant, you know, we, that would be acceptable, but any new or replacement installations of lumber um, cannot be treated wood. So um, typically we see um, locust and cedar being the options that folks will choose because they're more durable and last. Um, so any other questions about treated lumber, let us know, we can talk about it in the Q&A. I see a couple people asking about the slides in the chat and absolutely, this, is, this presentation is up as an attachment in the agenda for this part of it. And um, we're also happy to email it or put it up on our website after. So maps, this is part of the requirements of that application packet. You have to do a map. This one's handwritten uh, or hand drawn. We see, we see less of these these days, but there's a lot more computer generated maps now, which are, which are fine. Um, we just ask that you know, there's certain things that need to be on the map because this is really the way that you know, the inspectors orient and get a sense for your farm when they're on site or even virtually viewing, but also the staff who, who reviews your files and makes your certification decisions that helps them kind of really orient on what your operation looks like. Um, we don't always get to go out on site. We don't always get to see your farms. I mean, we do try to attend inspections and make time to kind of um, understand some of that, but you know, often we don't. So this really helps us kind of get the big picture. Um, we're going to get to some prohibited substances here in a minute. I just saw that on the chat too. So um, yeah, so the maps, 
you have the compass, you got your field IDs, your acreage, natural features should be um, identified, including natural resource areas, power lines and roads. It says page size best, but that's a little antiquated now because I feel like we're doing so much electronically. We're not getting as much. Um, but yeah, as long as it's legible and meets those requirements, that's kind of what we're looking for in a map. So soil fertility and crop rotation, we're kind of just going to quickly make our way through those main sections of the regulations. This is the first in the crop production area that we talk about. Tillage and cultivation has to maintain or improve. There's those keywords again. Um, physical, chemical, and biological condition of the soil. Have to do this through, use, through the use of rotations, cover crops, application of plant and animal materials. There are some details here on what are the specifics when we're talking crop rotation. Um, you know, there is some flexibility in this for you to tell us what your ideal rotation is and then we evaluate that for whether it's compliant or not. Um, typically, you're changing your crop year to year. You're not growing the same annual crop um, two years in a row or three years in a row. Sometimes as part of that long-term crop rotation, you might have two years of a crop, but then you're showing how you're switching it out to other crops who are kind of meeting the guidelines for um, the fertility requirements, in which case we could then approve that plan um, you know, obviously there's the typical rotation that's sort of like corn, soy, and then small grains. Um, if you're doing fill crops, that's great. Um, sometimes we get occasions where people want to do corn two years in a row with a cover crop in between and then switch to something else that could be considered as well. So, you know, there's, there's, there's not any one specific rotation. And if you're doing vegetables, they're also, you do also have to be rotating there as well. Um, typically, we'll see things like um, family rotations. People will grow a certain family of vegetables in a bed or a field one year and then, or maybe two years, and then they'll switch it out. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. And then you're thinking about your organic system plan is how you're going to be meeting those crop rotation requirements as well. Okay, so plant matter versus manure versus compost. We get lots of questions about this. People are like, oh, I gotta use organic manure if I'm gonna be organic. So hopefully this will help clarify that a little bit. Um, organic matter or plant matter, however that terminology, however we're using it, could include things like kitchen scraps, clip, clippings, lawn clippings, any kind of clippings, decomposing plant materials, vegetable coals. Um, there's really no restrictions. The regulations specifically say uncomposted plant materials are allowed. So when you're talking about mulch um, and things like that, what you want to use as, as mulch options, typically if it's plant matter, it's allowed. We might look at some residual um, contamination concerns if you're using a lot of lawn municipal lawn clippings, for instance, that could be a concern. Leaf mulch doesn't tend to be as much of a concern for what we see around here. But these are just some considerations, but for the most part, plant matter is allowed. Manure um, includes raw, aged, piled, um, whatever other version of the word manure you can think of. Um, anything that ha even contains it that has not been composted per the regulations follows a restriction for um, human consumption crops. So if you're applying manure to your field, and it's only crops for animal consumption, no restriction. So that's fine. If you are, you know, if you have dairy farm or if you're doing field crops that are for animal feed, um, you can apply that manure. And, um, you know, there is a recommendation of not more than 15 tons per acre per year. But, you know, for the most part, there's not a restriction on applying manure. Um, unless it's human consumption. So the way that works is there's a time frame from between when you incorporate the manure into the soil to when you're harvesting um, the crop. And how that works is it's 90 days between when you're incorporating it to harvest. If the edible portion does not have contact with soil particles, and then it's 120 days, four months, if there is contact with soil particles from when you apply the manure to when you're harvesting um, 120 days in between. So typically 
120 tends to be most things. Most things we feel does have contact or there's possible to, for it to have contact with ground or soil particles. This does say ground, but we, we use the term soil particles more because you, know, you have to think about things like rain splash up or other ways where that can come in contact with an edible portion. So 90 days, for the most part, tends to be restricted to things like sweet corn, fruit trees, maybe not a whole heck of a lot else, but you know, we're also open to arguing if somebody wants to bring in their argument for why it should be 90 for whatever it is, you know, we might be willing to, you know, entertain and um, determine whether that's compliant or not. So, but for the most part, 120, we do look at this, the inspectors look at this, our reviewers look at it, we look at your applied amendment record and we look at your harvest record and we're looking for that 120 day um, time frame in between. So things like, you know, your early greens, not gonna happen. So what we see a lot in organic systems is manure being applied in the fall or being incorporated in the fall for the earlier spring stuff. Yeah. Um, so compost is the other alternative if you want to apply manure and not have it be within that those wait times. Um, there are some very, very specific requirements in the regulations for how to make unrestricted compost. There are C to N ratios, carbon to nitrogen ratios that need to be met between 25 to 1 and 40 to 1. Keep in mind, if you're, if you're a composter, that's an initial C to N, that's not the final um, ratio. That's for when you just establish your pile, which consists of a mixture of manure, animal materials, and plant materials, that you're looking for that initial ratio to be in between there. And then you must maintain temperatures for a certain amount of time, um, 131 to 170 degrees, three days if you're doing a static aerated pile, 15 days in a windrow um, with a minimum of five turns. So mostly when we're looking at compost, it's, we see mostly windrow. And so, you know, we are looking for that 15 days at that temperature with that five turns in there. And we have a questionnaire or a form that if someone's interested in there, um, that they fill that out. I'm seeing in the chat about Manure piles over three years old, it doesn't matter. Um, the regulations are really specific that there's there's no like exemption for time. And this is one of those where like, that's not really sound and sensible, but it is the regulation. Um, so yes, it doesn't really matter. That's why we mentioned aged above in the manure category. It's because, you know, there's really no exception to that unless you've composted per these fairly stringent requirements. There are some other exceptions um, for processed manure or vermicompost. If anyone's doing those, um, we'll be happy to talk with you more in depth about those. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's sort of the baseline. If you're, if you're interested in the compost and this is like a make or break for you, please do talk to the office. There is some nuance to this that we probably can't get into today. Uh, well, we could in the Q&A if anyone's interested, but yeah, I mean, it is fairly restricted, but you know, it's, there could be a conversation to be had about it. Yeah, so yeah. So I think that's about it. Um, yeah. Okay, keep an eye on the time here. Crop pest, weed and disease management is the next section of the regulations. Um, Really, when you're thinking about how you're going to manage this aspect, you're going to want to think about your management practices first. So kind of like the first step, there is a hierarchy for pest management. And the first thing is preventative um, or through management. Like how do, you, how do you work with what you have to prevent the issues rather than relying on some method um, or input to, to then resolve it? So some of those management practices could include crop rotation, sanitation, like removing the weeds at the pest habitat, specific cultural practices, perhaps selecting species that are suitable to your, your farming site. Um, then when those are not um, sufficient, you would then move to mechanical or physical methods. And these could include um, establishing habitat for the natural enemies of pests. So getting some beneficial insects or non-synthetic controls, lures, traps, repellents. 
and then you can um, go to different inputs that, that can be allowed, um, substances that are included in the regulations on what we call the national list, which we're going to talk about next is we're going to get a little more in-depth on, on materials and, and what's allowed and what's prohibited. Um, weed problems are probably the most common thing we see with organic. I mean, you know, we want weeds, it's a thing, right? Um, so, you know, here's some of the alternatives that are listed in the regulations that you can control weed problems with. Mulch, of course, mulching with non-synthetic materials, um, mowing or livestock grazing, hand weeding, of course, mechanical cultivation, clean heat, and then um, plastic or synthetic mulches um, can be allowed, but there is a restriction that they're removed from the field or the organic production area where they're being used at the end of the growing or harvest season. So um, yeah, keep that in mind. If you're, in, if you're using plastic or synthetic mulches, they do need to be pulled up by the end of the year unless it's on a perennial system, in which case like blueberry bushes, if you've got fabric down that is allowed, um, but we monitor it for degradation. So, yeah, um, nematodes would be allowed. They would be as long as there's no GMO carrier that, that they're arriving in, but we would consider that a beneficial system. Tarps are allowed. We've had some really good conversations at previous winter conferences about tarps. Um, they gave a really good one at the last winter conference. That was, it was really interesting. But yes, um, when we think about tarping, it's more of a tool. Um, it's not going, it's not really being incorporated into the soil or under the level of the soil or like becoming part of that, which we might think of a plastic mulch doing. Um, so yeah, just laying that tarp on top and letting it solarize or do its thing and then removing it, that is a lot. Yep, just answering some questions on chat in case anyone's wondering where those two came from. Um, so yeah, this gives you an idea of some of the things you can do when you're thinking about your pest weed and disease management. And then if that is insufficient, then you would maybe move to thinking about inputs. So inputs, allowed and prohibited substances. This is definitely an area that um, gets a lot of gets a lot of attention. It's important. People have a lot of questions about what can I use, what can I not use. So the way it works in the regulations is there's specific sections um, broken out into crop, livestock, and handling or processing. And then they break it down into synthetic and non-synthetic or natural. So it's also called the national list. If you hear someone saying that, it's referring to these, these lists of allowed and prohibited substances or materials. Excuse me. So the way it works is all naturals, all non-synthetics are allowed unless specifically prohibited. So when you're looking at that section of the regulation, it's only going to show you prohibited naturals. It's not very many. It's a very, very short list. And then synthetics are prohibited unless specifically allowed. So it's sort of kind of the way to think about it. Um, so when you're looking at uh, using a synthetic material, it has to be on that very specific list in the regulations. If you're thinking about a natural, you're pretty much okay, unless it's prohibited. No matter what, we definitely recommend you don't try to understand the national list. Um, you know, it, on face at face value, you could look at this list and, and be like, oh, okay, I can use this or I can use that. But there's a lot of nuance um, to materials, especially blended um, formulas or things that are manufactured. There tend to be um, a lot more to it than just one ingredient. Um, so we do very, very strongly recommend you contact the office before you apply something to check and see if it's allowed or if it's not allowed. Um, yeah, we just wanna make sure that people aren't putting something down and then they find out that it was prohibited because at that point there's really nothing we can do that would disqualify your land for three years. And this has happened, this does happen, this is one of our more frequent um, you know, compliance issues that we come across is people who have applied something because the dealer said it was okay. Um, the neighbor used it who's also certified or um, the bag said so. <laughs> you know, the, there isn't really a 
you know, when you're looking at fertilizers or soil amendments, they don't regulate the term organic. The USDA doesn't oversee that. So there's like this, this part of the industry that's really confusing because you can go to Agway or someplace and buy a bag of organic something and it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, so definitely don't trust the labels, which is a very, which is very confusing um, until you kind of understand, yes, Omri is safe. And we're going to talk about that on the next slide a little bit. Um, so yes, just hold on one second about that. So yeah, I mean, so that's sort of roughly how we think about the materials and, and the review of them when we're trying to determine. Do keep in mind the prohibited, the big three, we call it which is GMOs, genetic modification, ionizing radiation, and sewage sludge. Those are prohibited across the board, no exceptions. So keep that in mind. So getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty of what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, they must be approved prior to use. We've kind of already talked about that a little bit. And we do perform a materials review. Um, we have a database internally that's pretty extensive that you know we've looked at through the years thousands of materials so there's a good chance if there's something you want to use we've already looked at it so just contact us it's not an, an external database it's not something that can be um, looked at by the general public though we do have lists for livestock inputs on our website um, so those can be those are accessible but for the you know all of it you know it's kind of more of an internal system but anyways please contact us if you're not sure. There are materials that are allowed across the board. Um, that would be OMRI, which is Organic Materials Review Institute. They are um, an organization that's recognized by the National Organic Program for the material review. And anything that's OMRI listed would be allowed as long as you're using it per the actual usage. Um, something could be OMRI listed for a very specific use. Um, so just be careful that you're paying attention to that. And it's not always allowed across the board, depending on what the material is. But we do accept OMRI. And so if you're at Agway, or like I was saying before, don't trust the bag. If you see the OMRI label, most likely that means it's okay. What happens with that sometimes is um, the list changes fairly frequently. Um, but what's out in the supply chain might not. So I guess what I mean is, you know, periodically OMRI will drop materials or formulations. It'll no longer be OMRI listed, but there could still be some material out in the marketplace that's there. And we may allow use up of that. We may not, depending on what it is. So that's why we just encourage you to, to contact um, us no matter what it is, if you're thinking about where our certified so that we can just give you the most up-to-date information and to make sure you're not taking, you know, and there's no risk with it. Um, yeah, and I guess the last thing I wanna say about inputs right now is keep in mind that organic certification is not about switching out conventional for organic materials. We do see this, we do see people who come into the program and they wanna take their, you know, 20 or 30 some odd conventional pest controls and fertilizers and find organic um, versions. And it's like, you know, that's not the intent of the regulation. So, you know, keep that in mind. This is more for when, you, when you've when you tried everything else and nothing else is effective, then you, you kind of look at what materials can I use. Okay. Um, seeds, organic seed. This is another really common one that we get a lot of questions about. What can you use? Um, organic seed is required if it's commercially available. So what does that mean? It means that you're searching for organic, that you're checking at least three viable organic seed sources, and then you didn't find what you were looking for in organic due to quality, quantity, or form. Um, and then you can use conventional seed as long as it's untreated and non-GMO. So that's pretty much how it works. Organic, if it's commercially available, you've done a seed search, you've documented the three places you've checked, maybe you made a phone call, maybe you went to their websites, maybe you're checking the catalogs, whatever it is, and they're actually companies who sell organic seed, um, not you know the conventional seed guy down the road, and you're like, oh, he didn't have organic you know, tomatoes, I guess I can't find them. 
um, you know, we, we do expect that you're actually checking organic sources. There are resources um, we provide with the application packet and also it's accessible other ways. There's a lot of, lot more organic seed out there now than there used to be. So yeah, you can't find organic, you document, you've checked three places. Maybe you can only get a huge quantity and you need a small quantity or vice versa. Maybe you've tried it before and you have issues with, um, it's a, you know, how effective it is or how well it grows or germination issues and stuff. And you can document that as a quality um, concern. And then that kind of gives you the opportunity to look at um, using untreated non-GMO conventional seed as well. Transplants or annual seedlings must be certified organic, no exceptions to that. So keep that in mind. If you're growing vegetables and you want to go buy seedlings, have to be certified organic. Make sure you're getting the certificate or you're seeing on the plant tag where it's identifying the, cert the, the operation and who's certifying it. We, seems like every year we get like one or two of these who's bought transplants and like, oh yeah, they're organic. And we're like, okay, where's the certificate? And then they're like, oh, and then they go back and try to get the certificate and lo and behold, that was not organic, actually organic. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, pelleted seed could or could not work, depends on, on what the pellet is. There are a lot more organic pellets and organic treated seed out there now. So, you know, there are, there are treated and pelleted seeds that have um, organic approved materials on them. Generally, if you're buying a seed and it's certified organic, whether it's pelleted or um, treated, if it's certified organic, has the seal, you can see the certifier listed. That means it's fine. That means the treatment is covered under that certification. Um, perennials kind of work the same way as seeds or annuals must be organic if commercially available. Um, there's a lot less organic planting stock for perennials. So we definitely see a lot more non-organic perennial stock being used, which is allowed again, as long as it's untreated, non-GMO, and by untreated, we mean um, nothing applied to it post-harvest. If you're buying a non-organic um, raised planting stock, you know, th there could be things in the growing practices that were done conventionally, as long as it's not kind of, there's no applications to it once it's been prepared for sale. Um, if you are though going to sell a perennial as planting stock, that's your intent with what you're doing with it. It has to be managed organically for one year. So keep that in mind as well. Um, inoculants tend to be fine as long as they're non-GMO, but we would approve that like other inputs. Okay, I'm gonna move on. Buffer zones, here's another common area. Um, you need to prevent the unintentional application of prohibited materials. Um, this could be pollen drift for GMO contamination spray drift, runoff, um, you just need to think about, it's very case specific. So sometimes people will call us and ask us for a number. How big does my buffer zone need to be? We'll be like, well, it's really dependent. Our guidance manual does list some, some starting point numbers and we can discuss this more if anyone has specific questions about the size of buffer zones. But there are some general guidelines for if there's just regular, I don't know, backpack spraying or something going on next door, or if there's air blast spraying going on if you're next to an orchard, um, you know, there's a completely different sort of guideline for that. So you kind of have to look and take into consideration what's going on around you. What are the neighbors doing? You know, what is the wind direction? Where am I? Am I, is there runoff that could be occurring? Um, and then you would establish that buffer zone. It could be um, a hedgerow or it could be empty space. I mean, it could just be a field. It could be a part of your field even. Sometimes we'll have people who can't create a buffer from their neighbor that will take the outside rows or outside portion of their organic production area and turn it into a buffer zone. And then either they, they might not plant in that area or they might plant and harvest that. So if it's a field crop, for instance, let's say corn or something, they would harvest those outside rows um, as non-organic separate it, do something different with it, clean it, clean out the equipment, and then move into the organic production. So um, yeah, buffer zones are important and they, it can be confusing. And this is one of those areas where we'll, we'll work with you to get to where you need to be. Sometimes it takes the inspector being on site to really determine whether your, your, your buffer is adequate or not. Um, but any questions with that, we can talk about that some more.
As far as GMO pollen contamination, this really only seems to be coming into play mostly with corn. So if you're growing organic corn and you have um, conventional corn within something like 660 feet, um, there is a risk for, for cross contamination or cross pollination. So we would generally recommend you don't grow corn if that's the case, but sometimes that's not really practical or feasible. Um, and if that's the case, we, we do have a form for this, but we would ask you to document um, the planting dates and the corn type, the day length of the corn types, and then ultimately the tassel dates so that we can determine whether enough time has elapsed between the tasseling to prevent um, contamination. Usually we're looking for at least two weeks between, between the tassels of the organic corn field and the non-organic corn field, or the conventional GMO cornfield. So, you know, this is something that, that is important and we do test um, for GMO contamination at times. We test 5% of our operations annually. We're required to do this for pesticide residue and, and GMO contamination can be part of that at times as well. We certify hemp. Woo -hoo. I think there's some hemp workshops going on if anyone's more interested. This is just like a nice little flyer we did that we like to put out there. I think most folks know you can certify hemp now, but if you're interested in it or have questions about the nuance, because it can be nuanced, please contact our office. We have some, some resident experts in hemp um, that have been part of this you know, is really have their, have really aware of what's going on with the industry with hemp. So if you're interested in that, we have Q&A, come talk to the LLC table, the certification table on the live chat. Um, yeah, okay. Livestock, oh boy, I'm talking a lot. When does this, this workshop ends at 1.15? Can someone confirm? It does end at 1.15, but you can okay. read. Um, oh boy. Go on a little bit later if you want to. Oh, well, that's nice of you. Well, we'll see how much we can get through. I might not go super in depth into livestock unless someone, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, unless someone really um, has specific questions so we can kind of move through. So, okay, let's talk about livestock quickly. Um, poultry, pigs, ruminants, and grass fed. We certify it all. Um, so some, some, some general things to keep in mind, no matter what type of livestock you certi you're looking to certify or do certify, all livestock operations need certified organic pasture or outdoor access areas. So if you're going to purchase organic animals, make sure your land is certified prior to bringing them to the farm. Um, talk to us, there are, there's always exceptions to the rule with, with certain things. So if you're not sure, you know, we can have a conversation about that but have to have that certified organic pasture, outdoor access. And then you have to establish a pasture plan um, unless you're not pasturing. So if you're doing chickens or pigs, you might not need pasture for instance, but if you're doing ruminants or yeah, anyone else who uses pasture, then you're gonna want to establish that. It is in your organic system plan document that you're filling out. We're gonna ask you a bunch of questions and that is kind of what establishes that pasture plan. It includes location and size of pastures, what type of grazing methods you're using, location and types of fences, shade and water locations, and what your fertility and seeding system might look like, and any sort of um, natural resource considerations. So that's, um, you know, kind of for all livestock operations, unless you're not pasturing, maps, kind of similar to we talked about field maps. We do look for diagrams, barnyard layouts that shows where the storage areas are, if there's organic and non-organic, where the different outdoor access areas are and things like that. For poultry, um, we'll talk a little bit about each section of the regulations as they apply to the different types of livestock you might certify. For poultry, they must be managed organically from the second day of life. That means you can buy your day olds and get them shipped in the mail. And then when you when they arrive, they're managed organically from that point. So that is the most common way that we see poultry dealt with. If you're doing layers um, in buying pullets, I need to be certified organic. So keep that in mind. Pre-existing flocks for the most part are not certifiable. 
they need to be from that second day of life. Um, we were flock ID records are required. So feed must only receive certified organic feed. Any additives or supplements or other things that you, you're adding to it must either be approved or, or organic. So food scraps, for instance, must be certified organic. Um, be sure when you are buying feed that you're either buying a retail consumer ready bag that has the certification information on it. So you know you're getting a certified organic product or that you're getting an um, organic certificate with your purchase. Um, healthcare products, kind of the same way as we talked about with, with feed and approved um, additives, they just, they have to be allowed per the regulations, per that list we referred, talked about earlier with the, with the crop side of things. There's another list for livestock about synthetics that are allowed, and naturals or non-synthetics that are prohibited. So the same exact thing here. A Couple of things to keep in mind, vaccines, um, non-GMO vaccines are allowed. Naturals for the most part are allowed. If you're feeding them daily, they have to be certified organic. Um, FDA approved vitamins and minerals are allowed. And there are some other management practices that may be allowed. So the slide lists beak trimming and wing clipping. Um, if you're established that that's needed for welfare and it's you know within the specifications, that could be something as well. Your living conditions must allow for the health and natural behavior of the species. So our recommendation for poultry, if you're gonna do chickens, is at least 1.5 square foot per bird, indoor and outdoor. So we'd like to see that amount of space taken into consideration for both the indoor space and the outdoor space. Three square feet if you're doing turkeys. No cages, no wire floors. Bedding has to be allowed. So if you're doing shavings, they have to be untreated. If you're using hay or straw or an agricultural product, they have to be certified organic. Daily year-round outdoor access is required um, unless a temporary exemption applies. This is a very specific list in the regulations for temporary exemptions um, for them not having that year-round outdoor access. So, you know, we have, a, we have a form that's like a calendar, different places where you're going to document in your organic system plan, um, temporary exemptions you may be using, times when um, the poultry may not be getting outdoor access. For the most part, even in the winter, we expect there to be uh, the ability for them to have outdoor access if you're doing layers, you know, and you're keeping them through the winter. The doors should be open on nice days. They should be able to get to you and go out of the door. Um, yeah, I mean, it says here on the slide, they should be large and frequent enough so that they can get out of there. Sometimes we see these plans um, for, I don't know, a layer house and all it has is a tiny little door um, where, you know, there's no way all of the poultry would be able to even know it's even there, let alone make their way out of it. So we are looking at things that's, you know, you need to take into consideration um, that all of your birds will be able to move around and get out if, if they, they need to or should be able to. Direct access to sunlight and fresh air and the ability to demonstrate natural behaviors. So pecking, scratching, and dirt baths. These are things to take into consideration with your outdoor access area. Um, we aren't allowing concrete pads for a, an outdoor access area, so there should be actual ground that they're accessing. So swine, some of this is a little repetitive as far as some of the feed and stuff, so we'll kind of just hit on what's different about the different types of livestock. When you're dealing with anything really but poultry, they must be managed organic from the last third of gestation. So that's sort of like your baseline for an organic, um, for organic meat. So whether you're doing, you know, pigs or if you're doing ruminants, then they have to be managed organically from that last third of gestation. The way we determine that, the, when we start the clock, is when we receive your application. That's sort of when we say, okay, we've received your organic system plan. We could review it and verify that it appears compliant. Um, so, you know, it's all kind of about verification when you're doing certification. So you're thinking about, you know, we're thinking about, can we verify the 100% organic management? We find that can't really do that before we get your application. So that's kind of like when we start. So if you have pre-existing animals, they can be breeder stock and have um, organic offspring. 
Um, see what else, IDs are required. So there should be some sort of permanent ID system. Must receive only certified organic feed, including those food scraps again. Yep, kind of the same for everything else. You know, they have to be able to demonstrate their natural behaviors year round outdoor access. Ruminants, managed organically, last through digestion. Um, so really the only exception to that is if you're if you're doing dairy, if you're in, if you're doing milk, you know, there is the opportunity to do a one-time whole herd transition to organic. And so that's a year. And we would take you through that process if you're interested in doing that. We have a very robust dairy department. Um, and we'll talk you through all of the nuance on how to go about doing a dairy transition. So if you do that and you successfully com complete the one year transition with organic management, you would be eligible to ship organic milk after that one year. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. So recommendation for pasture if you're doing ruminants is 0.75 acres per thousand pound animal. That's sort of ballpark to keep in mind. Um, you know, there are very specific requirements in the regulations for dry matter intake. So you have to be able to show at least of a 30% average over, over the grazing season for dry matter intake from pasture. Um, so we give you the information to calculate that and to figure out if you're meeting that requirement or not. There definitely needs to be enough pasture available to your ruminant animals that you're meeting that at least 30% dry matter intake. And just to give you an idea of what we're talking about for the grazing season here in New York State, it should be, I mean, it has to be at least 120 days, but we tend to see um, more like 150. So during that course of that grazing season, you have to be keeping them on pasture making sure they're meeting that at least 30% dry matter intake as an average. Um, there are temporary exemptions that you can that are that are used as well for access to pasture as well as outdoor access, um, depending on different variables. So just keep that in mind as well. <laughs> okay. Things that are prohibited for livestock, antibiotics, hormones, most synthetic medications, animal byproducts. Um, you can't use parasiticides or wormers for slaughter stock. They are regulated um, in dairy animals with a withhold time on the milk, but cannot be used um, for meat. Tail docking in cattle is prohibited. Milk replacer is, rep is prohibited unless it's certified organic. There are some organic milk replacers out on the market now. Um, what is allowed, non-GMO vaccines, mineral and salt formulations. Just keep in mind, there could be prohibited um, inactive or excipient ingredients in those, such as mineral oil or flowing agents um, and things like salt. So, you know, nothing's always very, very simple. So, you know, definitely be sure to check when you're looking at your animal inputs as well, your livestock inputs as well as when we talked earlier about the crop side of things. Um, homeopathy and herbs are allowed. FDA approved vitamins and minerals. So pretty much status quo is what we've already talked about for the living, living conditions. Um, total confinement obviously is prohibited. Just to clarify, um, when we're looking at the ruminants, it's the year round outdoor access for animals six months and older. So any of them over six months old need to be having that outdoor access or being on pasture, depending on what type of livestock you're dealing with. There's some examples of when you can temp you temporary confinement for, um, for your livestock operations, inclement weather. Obviously that's a big one here in New York state. Um, so, you know, there, there are obviously times when you're not gonna be able to let your cows out or your animals out and that's fine. So yeah, we can talk about that more in depth if anyone's into the livestock and has questions about any of this. There's a lot more to it. This is just a really, really brief sort of overview. We also offer 100% grass-fed certification. Um, there's a NOFA New York version and 
um, the OPT or Organic Plus Trust, which we'll talk about in a second. If you want to add that on to your organic certification, you can. We only do grass fed with ruminant livestock operations that are already certified organic with NOFA New York. It would happen during the same inspection. Um, there's additional paperwork that you would fill out. Requirements would be meat animals are required to be grass fed for their entire life, so no grain from birth. And dairy animals have the opportunity to go through a 90 day transition. This just gets a little bit more into what you can or cannot do if you're doing grass fed, what's allowed and what's not allowed. I'm just gonna keep moving. Organic Plus Trust is the other grass fed that we offer. There are some milk companies who are requiring um, this grass fed certification and so we're offering that as well. There is different dry matter intake requirements for grass fed that's 60% DMI instead of 30%. So that's something to be thinking about if you're establishing a grass fed um, operation. There's a lot more to think about when you're kind of setting up that pasture planning and just moving from more of a grain fed you know, management to grass fed. We also have, we have staff who are very, very well educated and, and very involved in the grass fed program. So keep that in mind as well. Um, meat requirements, if you're, if you're gonna market your meat, they may be sold live, whether it's whole half quarter, and it can be processed in an organic slaughterhouse because you're making that organic sale live. So if you're making a live organic sale, what happens after, after that sale is made, now this, this, that part is in the possession of the owner, the buyer, and then um, however they, they handle it at that point is up to them. So otherwise, if you're gonna do retail cuts or you want to label your meat as certified organic, it has to be done in a certified organic slaughter facility. We certify some of them, there are a few more, we have lists of them. There's not a lot. We'd like to see more of them coming on board, but you know, I guess we will see what happens with that. So a lot of our beef operations or different operations who are focusing on meat, um, who have a hard time getting into the slaughter facilities, the organic slaughter facilities, um, can, can do the live sales. And that's so that's one thing um, that can be done. Make sure any labels that you're using are getting approved prior to use. So labeling, speaking of labeling, whether you have a farm label or any other type of label, if you wanna make an organic claim, make sure to get that approved. Um, we talked earlier in the, in the presentation about how regulated the organic term is and the usage of the USDA organic seal. So um, definitely do get those approved. There are very specific label requirements in the regulations. We can talk you through that. Um, and let in, and go back and forth with you until you get get the approved label. But please be sure to um, submit those or or talk to us if you're not sure what you need to include on an organic label. This is another one of those very common areas where we issue non-compliances a lot. Um, on farm processing and value added products, we're not going to talk about today, um, but we're having a handling and processing workshop Wednesday four o'clock. So anyone who's who's interested in that, please please do come to that. Um, record keeping, I just want to touch on this really quickly and then we'll wrap it up for Q&A. Um, this is very, very important. It's probably everyone's least favorite part, um, but it's also very critical if you're going to be certified organic that you've established an audit trail. You have to be able to track that product from, from start to finish, from origin to sale, so from seed to market or from dam or the, the, the mother animal to, the, to wherever this, the point of sale is. So we're looking for all of the forms that tie it together along the way. We supply the forms. You could have your own forms and that's fine as long as it's traceable and includes all of the necessary information. Um, you can absolutely use your own record keeping system, but we have a lot of sample forms um, to get you started or for folks who just want to use those. Keep in mind, you have to keep your records for a minimum of five years. So just gonna quickly show you some examples of what those records might be. There's gonna be your applied amendment spray records, all of your seed and transplant records, your field histories, harvest records, sales records. If you're doing livestock, your purchase feed log, your livestock medication and healthcare records, you've got your dry matter intake and feed ration forms, your outdoor access, your egg collection records, 
If you're doing processing, you're going to have your ingredient receipts and organic certificates, production logs, sales invoices. So, you know, there's a lot of different types of records that could be required. And again, we'll work with you on establishing that record keeping system. But the overall point when we talk about traceability is what's demonstrated in this slide right now, the ability to take one product and, and track it through your system. So I know this is pretty small and you probably can't see it that well, but it's showing a lot number on a purchase invoice that then that lot number tracks over onto the production log. Um, and then there's like a new lot number that's assigned internally, which then tracks down to the sales invoice. So that's sort of what we're looking what we're looking to happen within your record keeping system. The inspectors, when they come on site, they are required to perform a record keeping audit every year. They're going to be looking to do a trace back where they're going to pick a sales invoice or, or, or a final you know, inventory of something and take it all the way back to the beginning. And they're also going to do an in-out balance or a mass balance where they're going to take a you know, period of time perhaps and make sure that that makes sense with, with the information in the record keeping system. So maybe it's all of the pumpkins that were sold between October and December, they're gonna take that back and look at your harvest and they're gonna take that back and look at maybe your seeding records and look at your seed invoices and, and whatnot to kind of make it all tie together and make it make sense. So keep that in mind when, you're, when you are establishing a record keeping system, like that's the overall intent of the system. And then we just, we um, continue to monitor compliance. Once you're certified, that process, you know, you do it over and over again. Every year we update the information and inspect you. We perform unannounced inspections or spot inspections. We're required to do that. Um, we do the residue testing I mentioned previously. We might do market monitoring. We might go to farmer's markets and make sure that everything is being displayed correctly and complaint investigations. So whenever we receive complaints, we do take that seriously and spend time um, making sure those are resolved. Why be certified organic? Probably everyone at this conference already has an idea of things that, why they might want to be, but. Okay, we made it. Um, so q and I don't know. If anyone has any, um, I'm gonna scroll through the chat a little bit. If any of the NOFA staff wants to chime in, please feel free. Um, I don't have any questions, but um, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I, I feel like I have seen it before, but every year I feel like I've absorbed a little bit more, so I'm able to make those connections. So thank you for that. Thanks, Bree. I'm just looking through the chat now. Can I, ask, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Hi, thank you. Great presentation about the composting piles. Um, so uh, we started this exercise at my farm and then because work took over, we let it drop. But so if we establish one windrow pile with those specifics, that really is our is our beta pile for you guys for the application that one pile as long as it's indicative of the processes that we use throughout all of our compost piles yeah that's a good question that is sort of how we would give the initial approval would be the beta pile or the one pile or whatever you're submitting the information on and then if everything checks out with that and we give you approval um, there is an expectation that compost monitoring logs will be maintained on site with your times and temperatures. And then the inspectors, when you have your annual on-site inspections or your annual inspections, they will look at your compost logs for the different piles, making sure that everything is remaining compliant to that initial information you submitted. Yeah. Okay. That, that's that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit of the trust system. We expect if you're doing something very significantly different in a different pile that you would let us know or submit another questionnaire for that. So I guess the idea is that it's just more or less representative of all of your compost. Cool. Uh, yeah. 
So I'm looking at just some questions on the chat. I'm just going to just really quickly go through them. Am I certifying a specific plant or products or the farm in general? Yeah, you're certifying organic production areas. So they could be, it could be one field. It could be 10 fields. It could be anything. So yeah, you're not really certifying your farm, even though we might say that we take into consideration that there's parts of a farm, every farm that's not certified organic, that's outside of organic production areas. So yeah, we're just looking at those sort of like those different compilations of sites. Um, there's not really a document that outlines prohibited substances. Um, but there are a lot of resources about what is prohibited and what's not. So if anyone wants more information about that, we can give you um, some more information. Wood chips are allowed um, as long as they're not treated. We actually don't ever see treated wood chips treated by meaning something's applied to them after they've been chipped. Um, so yeah, more or less wood chips are good to go. Um, there's not really a recommended lab for measuring the C to N, I mean, kind of people use either their own expertise or they might find resource documents online or they may talk to um, different labs or institutes to figure out that initial C to N. Um, but then we also have some resources internally that we use um, to determine that as well, but there's not like a recommended or specific lab for that. Yeah, the compost logs are, I don't know if that's actually a form that's on our on the website or not, but we definitely have that form. So you can always email us if you don't see it on our website. Yeah, so saved seeds, we get this question a lot. Um, yeah, if you've saved seeds that you've done prior to becoming certified organic, they would be considered a non-organic seed. Um, so you can't really certify them, but you could use them if you demonstrated through your seed search that you couldn't obtain it when organic. Um, and then you could use your saved seeds as long as they were untreated and non-GMO. But as you save seeds going forward, once you've started that certification process, any seeds you're saving at that point would be considered certified organic. But if you've got like an old stock of them, we would not be able to retroactively certify them. We look forward to hopefully working with you and, and maybe seeing you around and some of the other workshops.